Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is David Robinson. I am the Director of Membership and Meetings for the Linguistic Society of America, the LSA, which is sponsoring this webinar. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us, and I hope you and yours are staying safe and healthy. Um, while I'm talking, you'll be seeing a brief slideshow about the LSA and what we do. You'll also see some information about a special membership discount for participants in this webinar. We're excited to present this webinar on creating more just and inclusive learning experiences. It's the second in a planned series of webinars on racial justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the linguistics curriculum. We're grateful to our panelists for taking the time to participate and to you for being here. I'd also like to acknowledge that expanded access to this webinar is supported by the National Science Foundation under grant number 1924593. Any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. I also want to take just a few minutes to let you know how the webinar will work and to make sure you're familiar with the GoToWebinar control panel. If you'd like to download copies of the panelists' slides, you'll find these in the handouts section of your GoToWebinar dashboard. They are also available on our resource page for the webinar, and uh, everyone should have received an email about an hour ago with uh, links to that page. And I'll also send around a reminder after the webinar when the uh, recording is available. Um, you may also have noticed that your microphones are muted. This is so that we don't get um, miscellaneous background noise from all 250 of you. Um, we do encourage you to get in touch with us by uh, using the questions uh, widget on your dashboard, uh, on your GoToWebinar dashboard. And this is also what you'll use during the question and answer period uh, to ask questions. I'll forward those to our moderator and uh, she will pass them on to the panelists. Um, and so that's about it for me. I would like to turn the floor over now to our moderator, Lynn Santelman of Portland State University, and she will introduce our panelists. Lynn, take it away. Thank you, David. Thank you. So our two presenters today are Mary Buckholtz and Abdesalam Sudi. Sudi. Um, Mary is from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and she is a sociocultural linguist with a strong commitment to interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity. Um, she's also she's affiliated um, with several other departments at UCSB, including the Department of Anthropology, Feminist Studies, the Spanish and Portuguese, and the Graduate School of Education. Um, her research focuses primarily on how social identities and cultural practices are being brought in uh, into being through linguistic interaction. And she has investigated this question in, rela in relation to race, gender, and youth identities, in addition to how undergraduates become uh, socialized into math and sciences through peer interaction. Her current research seeks to explore the diverse forms of language and culture within California, especially in collaboration with graduate and undergraduate students and youth and educational partners in the Santa Barbara area. Uh, Suda is a lecturer and internship program advisor in the Department of Linguistics in the Dietrich School uh, at the University of uh, Pittsburgh and a faculty fellow within the University of Pittsburgh Honors College. He won the inaugural Diversity in the Curriculum Award in 2017 for his success in creating a diverse and inclusive learning environment. In 2018, he won the first ever Pitt Seed Grant Award for a proposal to build an engagement platform connecting linguists to the tech industry and communities. He led the publication of several collection, of a special collection on humanities and health at Pitt, and he co-edited a volume called Diversity Across the Disciplines in 2020. He has also produced a documentary on the meaning and value of diversity, living and working together, he serves on the board of directors for the Pittsburgh Pastoral Institute. He is a member of the Dietrich School Faculty Diversity Committee, and he has served as a mentor for refugees and immigrants in the Allegheny County Department of Human Services. His research interests include sociolinguistics, electronic health records, conversation analysis, Arabic linguistics, and cultural and linguistic diversity. 
I will now turn it over to Mary for the first presentation. And then uh, Suda will be our second presenter. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Lynn. Um, and as Lynn said, my name is Mary Buckholtz, um, and my pronouns are she or they. I want to start uh, by acknowledging the land uh, from which I am speaking to you. I'm not at UCSB right now. I'm in the city of Santa Barbara at my home, uh, and which also rests on Chumash land. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which UC Santa Barbara stands, the Chumash people. The UCSB community recognizes and honors their past and present stewardship, as well as the significance of Native American people's place in the learning and research activities of this university. I also want to uh, take this moment to acknowledge the many people who um, have helped me to understand the issues that I'll be talking to you about today. These are my colleagues and students, um, both past and present at UCSB. Um, these are some of the key folks who have helped me understand these issues. Uh, there are many others as well who are not acknowledged here. I want to start by giving you a sense of where I'm coming from and what I'm doing here today. Um, so as Lynn said, um, I'm a sociocultural linguist um, and uh, I do work on lots of different things. Um, and I think some of what I work on comes from my own experiences, both growing up and as an adult. I grew up in Indiana and Tulsa, Oklahoma, places where issues of race and exclusion and inequity are visible every day, but often not talked about. And uh, some of those issues are only now coming to the surface uh, many, many years later. Um, so Mary, a lot of, yes? Pardon me for interrupting. Um, we can't, I don't think we can see your slides. That's odd, okay. Um, it says that you can see them, so I don't know why you can't. Now, now, I, now we can see them. We see the uh, sort of presenter view on the left, but we see the... Okay, let me try a different way of showing the slides and see if that helps. Are you seeing it? Uh, no, it's blank again. That is really weird. It was fine and when we tested it, right? Okay, well, how about I, um, I don't really want you to see all that. So let me shrink it and let me shrink this so that we can all be on the same page more or less. Well, you're not going to, yeah, unfortunately, um, there we go. Um, I think we're caught up to where I am. So sorry, this is not gonna be quite as polished as I had hoped it would be, but uh, hopefully you all can at least see them now. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Um, I also wanted to say that um, my uh, experience um, as a linguist also is informed by my lived experience as a white cis female identified person, um, which has shaped uh, the way that I operate both in linguistics and in the world. Um, as an educator, I'm currently the department chair at UCSB, so I don't do as much teaching as I used to, but when I do, it's often large general education classes um, for people who are not planning to major in linguistics on such topics as language, race, and ethnicity, and language power and learning. I'd also like to um, make a point about why I do linguistics, um, because I think students want to know, as well as our colleagues, um, and it's because I love languages. I've discovered that it's somewhat of a taboo within the discipline to say this. I want to challenge that ch taboo because if we don't love languages, what are we doing here? Um, and I think that makes sense to start from where many of our students come to the field rather than rejecting that as an entry point. Um, I also think it's important for you to know that I don't only do linguistics. Um, when I'm trying to have fun, I often watch TV, especially international shows that let me practice languages. And uh, I also watch whales when there isn't a pandemic raging. Um, I'm a volunteer with the National Park Service and I have the amazing privilege of going out on the Santa Barbara Channel and talking to passengers on boats about whales. Um, but the reason that I'm here today, as I said, I'm not an expert on what I'm talking about. I'm still very much learning and unlearning. Um, I consider myself 
um, as Keith Walters once said, a racist in recovery. Um, this is real for people from privileged groups that we don't know our own biases. And so I have been learning um, to see differently, to understand the world differently through the guidance of my very generous colleagues and students. Um, so my work here today is uh, to try to challenge racism, white supremacy, and oppression generally in the field of linguistics. Um, I also have some jobs for you today. Um, I'm hoping the chat is active. I'm having a little trouble dealing with this new webinar interface, so I don't know if it's happening. But if it isn't, um, I hope you'll all get to work on chatting with each other. I think that's something you're able to do. I hope it is. Um, also, um, I'm hoping that you'll be using this time not just to learn, but also to share your own ideas. Um, and I really want to emphasize what I'll be talking about throughout uh, today is not just a set of tips, but really how can we think about inclusion, equity, and justice as a large scale intellectual and political commitment that will transform our discipline and must. Um, I also want you to notice what I'm sometimes succeeding and sometimes failing to do to foster inclusivity, uh, just to point out some of the things that I've done, telling you how to pronounce my name. I, for students, I would maybe not give them the IPA unless I knew they knew a lot of linguistics already. I'd give them a more informal form of phonetic transcription providing my pronouns. Normally, I would do that in a Zoom interface in my name label. I did try to set that up in this interface, and it didn't take. So sometimes technology fails us. Um, I acknowledge the land where I'm situated and the people who are the custodians of this land. Um, I also want to emphasize that land acknowledgments can sometimes be problematic. They can sometimes be lip service. And so if you use one, you should be doing so in consultation uh, with the Native peoples in your area. I also try to let you know who I am, not just as a linguist, but also as a person um, and why I'm here today. I tried to credit people um, who influenced me and the ideas that I'll be sharing, uh, not only by name, but also giving you an image of them so that they become full people for you. And also so that we can diversify this still very white space of linguistics by giving you a sense of the many different kinds of people who are already doing this work. Um, and finally, I encouraged you all to be active participants. Um, I see nothing in the chat, which makes me think that maybe you don't have access to it, um, or I hope it's not that you're all very shy. Um, but certainly, I hope that you'll be able to uh, participate in whatever way is possible within the constraints of our technology today. <laughs> so in talking about inclusion in the classroom, that's a very happy idea. Inclusion is a positive term, but obviously the dark underbelly of this is what we're really talking about is a reality of injustice and exclusion in the classroom that we're trying to remedy. And so we need to really confront what that means. What I mean by this is um, focusing first on what this means for students from dominant groups. Um, what it means to be from a dominant group is to have the privilege of knowing that you are the center of attention, that people like you will be the focus of learning and linguistics. Um, instructors are more likely to share the background of students from dominant groups. From the moment they set foot in the classroom or see you in a virtual webinar format like this one, they might see some connection. Um, depending, you know, if they're lucky enough um, that you are not a member of a dominant group and that that's visible, um, they will be lucky enough to have a different kind of experience from the very outset. Uh, but very few students still in linguistics have that opportunity. Uh, researchers that you'll talk about in your class are more likely to share the background of dominant students and to ask the kinds of questions that those students are more interested in. Uh, students can count on their language being taken as the norm in the classroom. They won't have to struggle to understand or be understood. Their lived experience is more likely to be taken as the norm so that they won't be exoticized or have to explain basic understandings about their culture. They can also count on their learning needs being accommodated. They won't have to go to extra effort to get what they need in order to access class materials and content. And finally, nobody's going to question their presence in the discipline or in the classroom. Nobody's going to suggest maybe they'd be happier or more comfortable in another discipline. Nobody's going to question their intelligence or their right to be in college in the first place. Conversely, it's just the opposite for students from marginalized groups in pretty much all linguistics classes, certainly at predominantly white institutions like my own. Uh, so students have to do extra work, which is often invisible for people from dominant groups, including instructors from dominant groups. 
Um, students have to find the relevance of linguistics um, for their own experience, their own language background. Even if the ling language that they um, speak or use is talked about in the classroom, it may not be accurately represented or it may be represented in a disembodied and abstract way um, that is not in keeping with their own cultural understanding of their language. And they will have to fight to position themselves as legitimate members of the discipline who will be interrogated often um, as either unusual or possibly available for exploitation by linguists who are interested in their languages. So what I'm talking about here is structural exclusion. Um, what we mean by this is that those from marginalized groups do not have equal access for systemic reasons. There are barriers put up from often even before their birth to their presence and participation in our classes. When they do manage to gain access um, through a combination of luck, resilience, and hard work, they may not be able to participate as much. They may not feel safe doing so. They may try and be shut down. They may feel detached from the material because it wasn't created for them or maybe uh, is actively hostile to them in ways that the instructor isn't even aware of. So um, often people from these groups are not represented in the curriculum. They may be overrepresented in problematic ways um, and uh, they may not be visible in the discipline even if they are hyper visible in the curriculum. Um, and often the work on their languages, cultures and experiences are being presented through the work of researchers who are not from the same background, which is inherently limited. We need to commit to uh, fostering members of communities to do work on their own languages and linguistic backgrounds as part of a more contextualized, culturally informed approach to linguistics. At the same time, I want to emphasize that <clears throat> not everything that um, people might label exclusion or perceive as exclusion is what we're talking about here. Um, simply being a mi numeric minority is not enough to be excluded or to be marginalized. If a member of a structurally dominant group is, in, is a numeric minority in a given space, that is a privilege. They should be very lucky for that opportunity to learn from people who have had different experiences from them. Likewise, feeling uncomfortable um, for a member of a dominant group when a, group when a space becomes more inclusive is not a problem that is to be expected and predicted and people should plan for it. Um, a little discomfort is necessary from the dominant group in order to make those from other groups more comfortable. And that means we have to give up some of that comfort level. That's what it means to learn and grow. I now wanna to shift to talking about what I see as the elements of inclusive teaching. And again, I'm giving you the big picture here. I'll try to give you a few specific details, but I really want us to have a philosophy about this, a theory about this, and not just a set of quick tips. We're not gonna fix these problems with quick tips. So what I mean by inclusive teaching is first and foremost student-centered teaching. Um, and that means teaching the students we have right now, not the students we taught last year who might already be different from them, uh, not the students that we were by any means or imagine that we were because those are almost certainly very different. Who we were as a student is very different from our students now. How do we find this out? We ask them. We ask them who they are, where they're coming from, both personally and professionally, where they're going, what they want, um, and hopefully we weave that into our class. And as we do this, of course, we gotta, we've got to recognize that our students are individuals, but they, they also have shared lived experiences as members of social groups, and that those all need to be validated and recognized in the classroom. Finally, in order to connect to students as people, we have to be people and not just linguistics teaching machines, um, which I have seen far too often and have sometimes been guilty of myself. And that means letting students know who we are, not just based on our research, um, and our qualifications, but where did we grow up? What was our schooling like? What are the struggles that we faced along the way? That's one of the best ways you can humanize yourself to your students is to let them know what it took for you to get to where you are now. Inclusive teaching is also flexible, and that means that we need to unsettle the certainties of being an expert and to position ourselves as learners as much as possible, to not know everything and to be vulnerable enough with our students to be willing to share what we don't know and to invite them to teach us as partners and collaborators in this process. Recognizing students' expertise will be crucial in this. 
In addition, we need to be responsible to keep our teaching up to date in every way from content to how we present our idea, these ideas and to make sure it's relevant to the students that are in our class with us right now. We also need to check in regularly to make sure we are in fact supporting our students' needs. Um, and that means checking in with them often to find out what's working and not um, a midterm quick evaluation, just asking students to jot down anonymously what's working, what's not working can be very illuminating, especially if you feed, build that, use that feedback um, to transform your class in the second half of the term. Uh, you can also use exit tickets at the end of each class or each week. If you haven't tried that strategy, just Google it. It's a really nifty little tool. Um, finally, I think more than anything, flexibility in teaching means expanding the boundaries of what we mean by linguistics, by the scope of any given class, and of what our own knowledge base is. Uh, we need to be open to making the field bigger and broader, not narrow and small. Unpacking what we mean by inclusion, I want to first unpack this with regard to courses. Um, accessibility is fundamental to this, and this cannot be done lightly or at the last minute. Um, almost inevitably, there will be errors and uh, imperfections along the way. Um, but if students can't access the material, they can't learn the material. Um, and this is not only true for students who have um, kind of a recognized disability by the university, um, but any student can benefit from you thinking about the many different ways students might need to access knowledge, the limitations and constraints they might face, especially as we do remote instruction. Um, but in any context, thinking about all the different groups that might benefit by something like um, multiple modalities of information availability. We also need to think about um, not just our individual course, but where it fits into the curriculum. And we need to be transforming not just undergraduate curricula, but also graduate curricula, uh, because graduate students, of course, are going to be teaching the next generation of linguists. Um, not only focusing on what courses are taught, but which ones are required versus optional. That certainly sends students a message. In my own department, uh, we have many different degrees, but only one is marked unmarked as linguistics. All the others are a marked form of linguistics. Um, David is telling me that people have asked what an exit ticket means. It's basically asking your students at the end of a class to jot down one question and one idea that they took from the class. You can use it for different things, uh, to identify problems, um, to identify confusion, or just to check in and say, how are you doing today? What's, what struggles are you dealing with in your life right now? Um, it's a great way of connecting with students and learning more about them and then following up with them uh, individually. There's more about this online, so feel free to Google that. Um, with regard to course content, it, it's of course important to look at what you're having students read, what you're giving them in lectures, but what aren't you telling them? What aren't you giving them? Um, especially with regard to their own backgrounds and experiences. And likewise, how are you delivering the course content and in what ways does this sometimes include and sometimes exclude people? Um, inclusion, of course, also means including people. Um, so thinking first about yourself and your teaching style, think about how you would describe your teaching and then check to see a reality check. How would your students describe it? Maybe taking a look at some of your student evaluations would be helpful or getting feedback from students. Um, and I'm being told I only have five minutes. That went really fast. Um, I also encourage you to think about the whole teaching team, TAs, yourself, any, anybody who's involved. And what are the limits of their subjectivity to the course material? Everybody's gonna have limits. The issue is how will you address those in the classroom and how will you overcome them and letting the students know that. In addition, you're going to need to think about inclusion across the curriculum. Um, first thinking about students and why they're in the class and who isn't in the class. Um, why are they not feeling welcome here? Who's participating and not? How does that change over time? Um, but also thinking about which classes already have some of these issues built in and which ones still need some of this material to be built in um, and start focusing on the hard ones first the ones that where you think i can't make it more inclusive by its very nature yes you can the stem fields are doing it we can too with regard to who inclusion includes this i think it's just known by most of us but bear in mind to be very inclusive in your understanding of who might um, be feeling excluded and on what basis, especially on the basis of intersectional experiences um, where students might be um, experiencing multiple forms of oppression simultaneously. 
there are inevitably pitfalls when we try to do inclusive and just teaching. Um, just a few to highlight here. Sometimes just not knowing what it means to provide basic accessibility, missing some of the fundamental ways that we are not recognizing parts of our the students in our class, parts of their needs, um, or not um, being able to reconcile the different needs that different students might have and trying to explain that to students and balance that. I think though one of the most fundamental problems is that instructors often feel uncomfortable talking about race or uh, talking about racism or oppression of any kind in the classroom, or they're afraid of making mistakes. But believe me, students will be much more appreciative if after you've well informed yourself, you make some mistakes and you let them know, I'm sorry, I made some mistakes and here's how I'm trying to do better. That honesty and that vulnerability will go a long way in building trust and respect. Um, inevitably, some of the mistakes that do get made um, is superficially or inappropriately trying to build languages and cultures of students into your classes um, or treating minoritized students as spokespeople for their group. Um, most students do not want to be placed in this role. They'll let you know if they want to speak um, as an expert in their uh, linguistic and cultural background. Or um, pulling in uh, minoritized colleagues or students, especially those more junior, um, to ask to fill gaps in your knowledge or to do a guest lecture for you without compensation. Definitely use the expertise that's out there, but compensate it fairly. And if you can't compensate it, then you need to educate yourself. There's many, many resources online um, that you can use. Finally, you should expect pushback and resistance um, from colleagues who don't value this kind of teaching, um, as well as students from overrepresented groups who are uncomfortable um, losing their place of privilege. And you'll need to plan for how to push back against the pushback, but don't let it discourage you. Um, quickly, some things that institutions can do. I am not a big believer in institutions as the starting point for change, but they must be involved in and forced to confront and engage in change. And that's why the individual efforts I've pointed to, that's for the kind of agency we have in our own classrooms. That's an important piece of this. Collective work is especially important at the grassroots level, and those efforts can then be brought to departments and larger institutions. Workshops are obviously a big piece of this. Trainings, talks, speaker series, these should all be ongoing and built into the way your part department or program works. Colleges and universities need to start um, not just rewarding as a bonus people who are good at teaching inclusively, but penalizing those who do not teach inclusively and recognizing that that's a sign of incompetence in your basic teaching ability. Um, so that's something that needs to be built in from hiring to tenure and promotion. The LSA has an important role to play here too. Um, so I'd like to see um, more public recognition of inclusive teaching. These webinars are a good start, but um, how about a teaching award? Um, how about making sure that plenary talks talk about these issues every meeting? Um, and an institute professorship focused on inclusive teaching as well as making that a criterion for every for, uh, professorship for the LSA Institute. Um, everyone everywhere should be recruiting and rewarding leaders who care about these issues and removing those who don't uh, because that's not leadership. Um, and finally, everyone has a responsibility both individually and collectively to work within and beyond institutions and to try to take on leadership roles to change these uh, si the situation we're in here. Um, I want to just very briefly mention uh, UCSB's Inclusive Curriculum Initiative as one example of this kind of work. Um, and this is something that uh, we've just started this summer. We're trying to overhaul our curriculum through a model where we've identified faculty and graduate students uh, working in teams, some as experts, some as, as apprentices in inclusive teaching. And we're doing this class by class, quarter by quarter, um, and we'll be holding a speaker series alongside this and then having a virtual symposium to share the results in spring. So stay tuned to, uh, for more information on that. I do wanna let you know if you uh, can just scan the QR code on your screen right now, there's other resources available to you, um, including an excellent article that has really helpful discussion questions at the end. Um, so that's the first item listed here. Another article coming out in language that gives the broader theoretical context for these issues and a couple of things that I've worked on um, as part specifically of working uh, to support black linguists. Um, I do want you to be thinking about your own responsibilities here, so I hope you'll be um, pondering these questions and if we can get the chat to work um, sharing these questions. I think you can at least send them to the organizer to post um, or in the Q&A we can hear more about not just your questions, but your ideas and the struggles. 
Um, and I want to thank you very much for thinking about these issues. Um, I want to encourage you to share uh, these materials and ideas with others. And feel free to reach out to me, but not next week when I'll be on staycation. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. All right, we're now going to turn it over to Suda. And if Mary, you can stop sharing your screen. And there we go. And Suda, you are up. There we are. Um, great. Can you all see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Jeff and David and the LSA committee for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, timely and important uh, initiative. Uh, also, thanks to uh, the interpreters who are helping us today. Uh, the audience who are joining us. Uh, some of us have started teaching this week, so we really also appreciate uh, your time. And uh, thank you also, Mary, for working together. And thank you, Plan, uh, for uh, moderating this session. As instructors, we are entrusted with producing one of the most powerful documents on campus, a linguistics syllabus, in particular, presents an opportunity to raise students' awareness about language use, identity, gender, culture, and more. Sorry, I'm trying to, okay. Like many of you, I spend a lot of time with my students analyzing language microscopically to understand its meaning, interaction impact, and I teach my students to use language inclusively to recognize linguistic prejudice and to embrace cultural and linguistic diversity. Language can highlight or also obscure our race, ethnicity, education, gender, class, religion, and culture. Language can be used to dehumanize and hurt others. In class, quality time is also spent reflecting on the knowledge we gain from the course and experiential learning opportunities to improve society and human relationships. Language can indeed be the door to justice and inclusion. Linguistic expertise helps, but it doesn't necessarily translate into building inclusive learning experiences. In other words, being a linguist does not automatically mean they are someone who is culturally sensitive or an inclusion expert. So I agree with Mary, I think we need to hold on lots of initiatives like this focused on uh, hold on um, uh, designing uh, inclusive learning experiences for our linguistic students. It is important to realize that we all come to the classroom with diverse experiences, worldviews, attitudes, values, and expectations. Our students, despite their youth, have a lot to offer us. Diversity and inclusion mean different things to different people and should be explored and defined. In 2017, I invited students, faculty, and staff to the University of Pittsburgh studio to discuss what diversity meant to them. Working from this concept that diversity means different things to different people, I embedded three questions in my casual conversations with the participants. The questions were, what does diversity mean to you? What is the value of diversity in your life and work? And how can we achieve it? The answers are enlightening and inspiring and encourage me to bring this idea to the classroom. Following where this led me, I began to think that the design of a diverse, inclusive and empowering syllabus tailored to students' goals and needs should also begin with a pre-course survey to help students feel valued and included.
Although I often start class exploring these questions, this year in particular, I formalized them into a pre-course survey. Some are related to how they want to be addressed. Some are related to their motivation and goals for taking the class. I learned, for example, that some students plan to be medical doctors, dentists, translators, teachers, and you all need the class for diverse purposes. Two students were heritage learners who shared that they need Arabic linguistics class, for example, to understand the inner workings of Arabic to speed up their learning. Other questions are about their preferred mode of learning for this most unusual academic year, whether they want to join in person, remote, both, or neither, that is asynchronous. Finally, I also prompted them to share what an inclusive class means to them. And I share some of their answers on the following slides. I'm going to be giving you a chance to read and I'll provide the summary in the end. So students expect to be uplifted, accepted, valued, not feeling under attack. Shy students expect to be empowered. Others expect guidelines about how to discuss sensitive topics. Others want to recognize the want us to recognize the economic turn downtown. Um, um, sorry, uh, others want to want us to recognize the economic turn down and want to feel safe in class. So naturally, it would help if the syllabus sets goals, objectives, guidelines, and expectations, and values. My syllabus also highlights the importance of diversity and collaboration. For example, when asking others to present or work as a group, I build in credit for short reflections on how they were successful or not working together. Collaboration is the future of work, and we shouldn't just talk about it in class but we need to find ways to address it very formally. In fact, employers want employees who can collaborate effectively, which is not taught or emphasized traditionally in our educational system. Collaboration, teamwork, critical thinking, diversity, and communication are actually the core defining aspects of the humanities. I think sometimes we specialize within the humanities, but we forget what the humanities is all about. And I remind my students and myself about this. Every syllabus, in my opinion, should also have an application aspect for real life and an opportunity for students to personalize the learning course concepts to reflect on their own experience. An inclusive syllabus should also include explicit statements on scholarly discourse, highlighting the importance of being open-minded, respectful, and avoiding personal attacks. The COVID-19 pandemic has spotlighted inequities embedded in our society. Many of the safety measures, unfortunately, will only reinforce these. But creating new connections in a virtual space is also hard. When COVID-19 first forced us in March to start working remotely, we have already gotten to know our students and people we work with. But what about new students at the beginning of an academic uh, at the beginning of an academic year? How will we get to know our new colleagues? We must create space for conversations to discover deeper connections and create a safe, healthy, and inclusive environment for everyone. Many of our students are working from home. And we can't put our relationships on hold during the pandemic. How do we bring people who want to work in person with those who want to hold to their newfound freedom and flexibility? And those who can't possibly meet in person for medical or economic reasons. Talking in class about the importance of building connections is good, 
but it's not enough. Talking about policies and statements and jargon about inclusive language is also good, but not good enough. An inclusive class requires purposeful engagement that differs from traditional learning models when working remotely, in person, or all of the above. I highlight the importance of high quality relationships and social time to get to know each other. I begin by explaining that what is essential is hidden. As many of you know, this is also expressed in the famous book by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, when the fox tells the little prince, what is essential is invisible to the eye. L'essentiel est invisible à l'œil. These quotes, I also have with this quote, I also highlight the importance of building deeper relationships with classmates and the instructors. I'm going to give you a minute to read these quotes from the Little Prince. Excuse me, Suri. Yes. Um, we've had a request from one of the panelists um, who has a, a, is visually impaired, or I think has, has noted that it's difficult for visually impaired to um, to deal with with uh, quotes that aren't read out loud. Okay. So I wonder I if you might. Yeah. Yes, I would like to. I would love to. I am sorry about that. I'm happy to um, also share with the participant um, what has come earlier uh, at the end of the presentation. I would be very happy to uh, to accommodate those needs, and I shall now read. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. It is the time you have wasted for your rose that makes your rose so important. To me, you are still nothing more than a little boy who is just like a hundred thousand other little boys. To you, I am nothing than a fox like a hundred thousand other foxes. But if you tame me, then we shall need each other. If you tame me, it will be as if the sun came to shine on my life. The stars are beautiful because of a flower that can't be seen. What makes the desert beautiful, said the little prince, is that somewhere it hides a well. Yes, I said to the little prince, the house, the stars, the desert, what gives them their beauty is something that is invisible. In thinking about our chances to meet those are who are different from us, I travel back in time and space to connect my students to my own upbringing and to essential but invisible aspects of my own life. For example, I reflect on three gathering spaces. In the village in Morocco where I grew up, my mom hosted women every day for tea cookie and cookies after lunch. The women gathered under the shade of a pepper tree and in an open part of our clay house, knitted broke seed shells to make argan oil and also chatted simultaneously about their personal lives. Other women could provide consolation, suggestions, or just an open ear. Additionally, the village community well where we gathered just before sunset, after the temperatures cooled down to fill our water jugs, was a place where people engaged with each other and shared updates about their lives. The third space was known to us as the Marwah, a slightly elevated hill occupied mainly by men. It was a catch up point before the Maghreb prayer about life inside the village and life outside. It was also a place where people who went to the city or other business stopped to fit in each other. These spaces brought people together. Talking about issues we face and struggles was an integral aspect of our lives in Morocco as it is all over the world. Similar to the community wall in my village is the water cooler. Socialization around the water cooler creates a relaxed and comfortable working environment and encourages people to get to know each other and connect on a personal level, which in turn increases the motivation. It has also been shown to be critical to the, to the generation of new ideas, which can be especially important for startups. For startups. Of course, especially in the time of COVID, this may not take place around an, uh, an actual water cooler, but it is yet one more reason why we need to build in our syllabus opportunities to connect and empower 
our students. Take a minute to think about this question. If I were to ask you to bring two items to this meeting today, items that represent who you are, what would those be? And please feel free to put those items in the chat if you, uh, if you, if you like. A capsule box essentially means a collection of items uh, relating to identity, um, culture, uh, heritage, history, and personality. And I have one right here, which has uh, a select items that occasionally I would take to a classroom to share uh, with my students, as well as narratives as they have just related from uh, growing up in, uh, in the village. This exercise is important to help you to get to know your students and engage in self-disclosure and self-assessments. And follow-up discussion about the shared items can take many forms. You could say, how was the experience? How did you narrow down your items? What did you learn from hearing other, people's, uh, uh, other people sharing uh, information about their um, culture box items? We use this technique with success in uh, SUDI 2016 and SUDI and Softball 2017. I invited participants to share their essential items in class, and we also prompted, prompted them to reflect on it. It encouraged empathy for others, improved the understanding of diversity, helped participants think critically about their culture, most importantly, helped people feel that their essential items are not left behind when they come to class, but rather there is space for those important and essential items in the classroom environment. Other groups within the University of Pittsburgh, including the medical school, law school, have done this as well. Other educational institutions, such as Vanderbilt University and Penfield High School in New York, have also adopted this technique. I'm very close to submitting two more papers on this protocol, and I would like to share with you some reflections as well about this. Student says, I was surprised to discover the deep meaning of objects, narratives I took for granted. I will not look at objects in my house the same way I did before. Another student shares, I did not, I did not know that C was Lebanese and Syrian. That made me very happy to learn. I often feel total isolation in Pittsburgh regarding religious, ethnic, and racial identity, and it was surprising to me that I never knew that about her. <clears throat> I really identified with Eduardo's concept of meal time being family time and how that related to his sense of family identity in my household that also represented a major construct of my identity. Sorry, I'm just moving the webinar information so I can actually read the quotes. The exercise not only helped all of us identify as a team and similar, but also created an atmosphere of vulnerability, acceptance, peer attachment early on in, early in, early on in the class. Another training expands on the, on the disclosure opportunities that this exercise afforded them. Racial and ethnic background is something that can define people. But as a white person of privilege, I couldn't find an item that fully encaps encapsulated that. It's a challenging exercise because as a white male of privilege, that privilege often goes unnoticed. Being married to an Asian immigrant has in fact opened my eyes significantly to the challenges and beauty of immigrant culture, but has also exposed me to differences in class language and Eastern culture that have completely shifted how we view certain things.
Another student talks about the value of faith and prayer in their family. They say they take this, the book of Psalms anytime they go overseas or they generally keep a copy with them to read while waiting for the bus and other times they need more strength. This work has been put together in a playbook recently, and it's also available through the University of Pittsburgh. You are also welcome to contact me directly, and I'll be very happy to work with you if you plan to adopt this protocol in your class. A major aspect of my teaching is personalized learning and going personal, which can be achieved through journals, reflection exercises, or class papers. Reflection allows for instruction that is matched to learning needs and the specific interest of different learners, individualized and differentiated. It allows students to be aware of their progress, personalize their learning, helps drive the curriculum, and it also requires the syllabus to be flexible. As mentioned earlier, it is always a good idea to set part of the grade for students to personalize their learning. Here is another example. Thanks to a grant from the Provost Office and the David Berg Center, I looked with my colleagues at 70 reflection essays collected over a period of 12 years for a master's level class. This seminar is taught to fellows in medical education. In other words, they have completed their medical training and are looking to educate others and are obtaining a, a master's degree in addition to their, medical, to their medical degree. We typically ask students in this class to think of a cross-cultural encounter with a student, a patient, a colleague, we ask them to describe it, what they learned from it, and how do we teach it to others. This paper helps them reflect on an ordinary encounter and apply principles from the course to their personal daily life. Another aspect of my teaching is a focus on experiential opportunities to empower my students to explore life and linguistics beyond the classroom. This helps me personalize the experience and helps them translate their skills to life after college. Two anecdotes energized me to take aggressive steps to build this program in 2012. During the summer of 2011, I met a student who wanted to teach English in Morocco and had asked for my help. And I asked him what he was doing with his time after he graduated in April and he answered that he was cutting a grass in a cemetery. In researching this further, I came across graphs that you see on the slides, but also commentaries online by humanities students rebuking our system of education and failing to prepare students for experiences and opportunities outside of the classroom. Academic employment, as we all know, is hard to come by. We can't all be teachers. Some of us have to go somewhere else and work. And humanities face an uphill battle in employment. Businesses may not fully understand the scope and applicability of linguistics methods. Graduates may not be prepared to work with their own tools on or know how to market their skills. We need to increase visibility of linguistics in our community and take advantage of timing and opportunity in Pittsburgh or wherever we are to make linguistics part of the solution to the problems facing our society. Humanities in Health, another initiative that I lead, and the linguistic internships are two major aspects that inspire and support my teaching. This fall, current one, will be rotation 12. I have recruited thus far 114 interns about 70% of them secure jobs by the end of the rotation, and we're still gathering data. The Humanities in Health initiative brings people together from humanities, health, business, industry, and education, and has been sponsored by the University of Pittsburgh, UPMC Health Plan, Cerner Corporation, McGee Women's Hospital, Family Medicine, UPMC, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and Semantic Compaction Systems. Thanks also to the linguistics and dean support, we have also extended the program to run throughout the year. And this is my amazing team that I work with. We have lots of projects in the works and we welcome collaborations. 
in 2018, we won the first ever Pitsit grant to expand linguistics program and build the humanities work hub within the University of Pittsburgh. We organized four conferences, the last one being Humanities at Work in the Community, Health and Tech Industries, Linguistics Paving the Way. Conferences have been a great way to create partnerships. We had speakers from different disciplines and departments, and we recognized community partners with awards, and we also highlighted interns' work and encouraged networking. In this talk, I highlighted some linked aspect of my teaching, but throughout my talk, I tried to link it to building deeper connections in the classroom through purposeful cultural engagements, personalizing students' learning through reflection work and experiential learning opportunities and caring for the student as a whole person. I would like to end this presentation with this extract from a column in the New York Times by David Brooks. Students learn from people they love, putting relationship quality at the center of education. And I can relate to this as I myself learn from people I love, and hence my passion to teach inclusively, engage, and empower. And thank you very much. So these are my references, and this is also my email if somebody is interested in getting in touch. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and um, uh, uh, thanks very much to our panelists. We've come to the part of the uh, webinar now where the panelists will take your questions. So if you haven't already asked them, you can uh, ask them using the questions widget on your GoToWebinar dashboard. And uh, I will forward them to our moderator who will pass them on to the panelists. Um, so, and we've already had several, so I think we're ready to go with that. Thanks. We have, so um, I will start, I think, this question might be directed more toward Mary, but both of you can certainly address it. Um, this question is sometimes if you come from uh, other communities or marginalized communities and reside in a very conservative area, giving information about yourself can be tricky or even dangerous. What do you suggest to make the connection with the students, but also to protect yourself? Yes, and uh, thank you for that question. And obviously, for people who are in structurally marginalized and oppressed groups in a community or context where that is not going to be supported and welcomed and protected, first and foremost, you must protect yourself. Um, but I think we can always share something of ourselves with our students. Um, at whatever level we are willing to do that and feel is going to make that connection because we are obviously all very complex beings with lots of different things going on and um, finding a basis for connection with one student um, might be you know, a shared interest of some kind. This is why I, television has become not just a teaching tool for me, but it's become a, a personal passion and that's been a way I can connect with students. Uh, it's quite an interesting place to uh, find out what students' interests are and uh, what they're excited about. Music might, might be another space. Um, so it might not be about, you know, every aspect of your identity or your own childhood experience, but whatever you're willing to reveal. And it can also be about your own journey. Um, and regardless of what it was that challenged you on that journey, everybody has challenges, um, I think. Um, and that's something that really allows us to connect to students wherever they're coming from to know that although I'm here in front of you now as an expert with a credential, I wasn't always. I was once a student not sure I was going to pass that exam or hitting some kind of roadblock along the way. Um, so those are um, the other ways that you can make yourself vulnerable in a more contained, controlled way that um, is good for the students um, if you're willing to share that as well. Obviously, never share trauma, never share anything you're not comfortable sharing. Um, but I think um, it's especially for people who are not from uh, oppressed groups who often don't think of talking about themselves as people um, because they're kind of already seen as people, I guess. Um, but uh, others sometimes feel a need to connect on that human level. Um, so different people are going to come at this challenge differently.
So yes. another, go ahead. You want to... Go ahead. Uh, this is actually, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I actually never thought ab about it, but it's good to keep in mind. So thank you for it. Also, it's, it, it's a good question too, because to also think about in the context of students where other students like the activity I described, they're also sharing their items and how can we also protect them as well? So it's, it's definitely an excellent um, question to something to keep in mind. I don't have any immediate strategies they can think about but uh, obviously like mary said you know obviously you are sharing certain things that are shareable in the context of a classroom to keep that in mind that would be something that's classroom appropriate uh, and i've never found for example personally that sharing my childhood experiences would, would go against me by my own students in fact i think from experience that has increased uh, connections with my students at least given them where i you know the background where i come from and it sort of also helps them and empowers them and encourages them as well to uh, come forward um, to share stories but yes uh, i think the sharing stories and sharing uh, essential items from your life needs to be approached with um, um, uh, with caution as well you know make it classroom appropriate in the context of students and learning yeah oh, I have two questions from from students or, or grad students um one is what can grad students do to better our departments we have many ideas in my department but few students are comfortable voicing their opinions because of the power differentials and fears of possible retaliation. I think I'll take this one first from my perspective as a department chair. I think this is a real concern and a real issue. I do remember being a graduate student and experiencing that um, uncertainty about what's going to be welcome um, and how do we make how do we transform the institution when we're so powerless within it? Um, first, I think recognize the power you do have if you are a TA or have other relationships with undergraduates or graduate students for that matter. Change can happen um, in the places where you do have agency. Um, I'm getting some feedback, by the way. I don't know if others are having that problem. I think it might be my own voice echoing. I hope that's not a problem for others. Um, with regard to making change at a more institutional level, it partly depends on the structure of your institution. Um, if your department culture is very hierarchical and doesn't already have student voices built into the democratic process, that's obviously a problem and it may not be one that you can address. Um, but uh, right now, departments all over the country in every discipline and not just in academia are being forced to confront their exclusionary practices at the level of uh, graduate participation as well. Um, and there are demand letters going out or sometimes request letters depending on what students feel comfortable doing. But this is something that is recognized. All departments should be prepared for it and should be receptive to it. If you aren't sure that's going to be the case, if you can't even identify a single faculty member who could be an advocate, this might not be the best avenue. You might wanna look at the institutional level. Is there something going on in your graduate division, in a diversity office, um, in the teaching uh, excellence office? Are there other places you can have an impact? Are, can you work with individual student affinity groups? Um, can you mentor undergraduates outside the confines of the institution? Don't let the institution define what you can do because it's not built for change. And if you rely on the institution to make things happen, nothing will happen and i say this as an administrator yeah. and not only that we should i also be uh, even if we were to rely on the institution i think the approach should come from the bottom i think the you know a bottom-up approach would work best to sort of like really target people's needs but to add to what mary said what we have in our department is we have formed um, a, a linguistics diversity committee that actually consists of two graduate students currently an appointment stream and, and, and a tenured faculty. So it's I think a committee like this also would be good to have in a department of linguistics to address concerns and be a platform where people feel safe to uh, discuss um, challenges and, and issues. All right, the next question is, um, so tr so true on marginalized students doing the extra work to find relevance to their own variety or experience. How can we start from not just a more intentional curriculum, but also then leave space for students to weave in their own experiences? 
do you, uh, do you mind? I'm happy to take the question. Mary has been on our list. So, um, could, do you mind um, again, sort of, sort of, uh, what's the the last part of the question, please, if you don't mind? So I, was, I lost my. How do we sorry. develop both an intentional curriculum and leave space for students to weave in their own experience? Yeah. So I. I discussed in my presentation, um, my syllabus always, obviously there is stuff that's for everyone in the class, certain things that are common for the you know basic aspects of what you should really know about uh, this particular class. But there's always room uh, in my grading scale to allow students to pursue independent projects to personalize, take those concepts and apply them to their own personal uh, personal experiences. Uh, and I just discussed that this morning. I had my first meeting with a sociolinguistic class where I'm allowing about 25% of, of the grade pr primarily to pursue independent projects to personalize sociolinguistics um, uh, for everyone. So that, so that would be one that would be one way of that really building and being very purposeful and, and keeping that in mind. And, take, and it can happen not just in a sociolinguistic, but in a, any class, any linguistics class should have uh, uh, an application part of it or an independent project that students can design and it personalizes the learning and increases the motivation and also really supports what um, the flipped classroom where the students become passionate about it and they are the ones stay up staying up the night not me so so we have to sell it in that way uh, i guess too yeah, and just to echo that, I, I also was about to make the point about flipped classrooms. Um, and I think Sudi's uh, discussion of, you know, getting every, there's a place for every student in um, the exercise that he talked about. Um, but I think when we're talking about an intentional curriculum, we're not talking about a rigid curriculum, right? And so part of this is not thinking about a curriculum as content that we pour into heads, but a curriculum as creating an intentional space for dialogue. and although I had really hoped that the chat would not be um, as um, obstreperous as it is. Unfortunately, it's not cooperating. So this is real, really a fail for the kind of thing I'd like to see, which is um, minimizing talking. The, the number one tip I give people in creating a classroom where there's space for students is talk less, give them less content and go more deeply into it. Let them take it in directions you never foresaw. Um, that's where I find a lot of excitement, and that's why I'm, I'm frustrated that I can't hear from all of you the brilliant ideas that you all, I know you all have, that are having trouble sharing because of our technology. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I, I also, I would like uh, talking, I, 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 it was really hard to deliver while and not be able to see people in the audience. I think this is not how we teach, not the, the, the cues, the nonverbal cues where people are saying yes or no, or maybe smiling, so I, I echo that, but I, I hope that we were able to at least share um, what we needed to uh, communicate. Uh, uh. All right, we've got a number of other questions that have come in, or they're somewhat related here. Uh, the first one is, in my area, a prevalent view of higher education is that instructors try to turn you from a normal, reasonable, per reasonable person into a liberal. Do you have any ideas on how to address this idea, which will undoubtedly be salient when you do identity and diversity activities, particularly with regard to first year courses? Yeah, I mean, my approach, that's not my approach. I mean, I don't, I mean, uh, I don't preach ideology. Uh, I empower students, I present the information and uh, and I let students um, lead the way. I'm, I'm not. My job is not to shape their thinking or change how they think. My job is to provide them with the tools. And like I said, going back to the previous question, and let them take those concepts to apply them to their personal lives. I'm not. My job is not to to change how they think, to change their worldview. It's the opposite. You know, with the cultural box, that purposeful cultural, uh, purposeful cultural engagement that I do, it's the exact opposite. I want students, we have seen quotes where people share the importance of religion in their life. I, I would appreciate if people, so like, again, my job is to create space for everyone. Not, uh, we're not competing over a, a common space or a single space. The idea is to engage uh, everyone and appreciate everyone's perspectives. And yes, and we can put these items in the syllabus, as I mentioned in my presentation, 
but statements like those are good, but they're not enough. So we really have to engage, like I said, in cultural engagement. So we learn to appreciate um, uh, where people are coming from. Um, but uh, that's definitely my approach is to, like I said, empower people, not shape them. I guess um, the way I would uh, think about this, it, I, yeah, I think we're, what we're trying to do is broaden students' thinking rather than changing their thinking. Um, and hopefully giving them new ways of thinking through the issues but it sounds like the question also is about um a per I, I may have misunderstood the question but there, there there's a kind of perception of linguistics as an indoctrination program that it's going to turn you into a liberal um and one of the ways that i address that um i don't hide my perspectives from students um but i also bring in other perspectives i you know don't think i can be neutral about things that um, our life and death issues in some cases that we talk about in my classes. Um, but I do um, want to make sure students understand that, you know, I, I am open to critique from all directions, including to myself, um, and try to create a space where uh, students can bring up concerns and questions and where I will bring those in too. So here's um, a liberal perspective. Here's the problems with this liberal perspective. Um, I will also give an example of um, how I've overcome this issue when I taught at Texas A&M after getting my PhD at Berkeley, uh, which was about the most liberal place you could be, going to Texas A&M, Texas which is about the most conservative place you could be um, for my first job. And I was teaching very conservative students African-American English. Um, and in that setting, I realized the only way that I could reach them was to talk to them as a northerner talking to southerners and so as a yankee i said tell me how people have talked to you how yankees have talked to you about the way that you speak as a texan and these overwhelmingly white students were very very happy and delighted to, to share you know nobody had ever asked them about this kind of linguistic discrimination that they had experienced and that then became the touchstone for the rest of the class. Every time we went into an issue in African-American English, I could say, can you see the parallels? It's different too, but can you see how this is also an issue? And some of those students, they were taking the class to become teachers. They came back to me and said, I didn't understand why I was taking that class. Now that I'm a teacher, I understand why I needed what you taught me. And so I felt like that was some of the most successful teaching I've ever done in that I was able to meet students where they were and they were able to change their thinking through the learning process. Right, and, and I think this is what makes the job of a teacher very difficult too, because we are a teacher for everyone, not the conservative and the liberals. We are a teacher for everyone. I think this is something that we have to keep in mind as well when, when we are teaching, sharing our materials, is that we want, we don't want to take one side or communicate, I'm on this side of students. So everyone, we're teaching everyone, no matter who they are or what they are, or what kind of things to believe in. So that's, uh, so it is, and that's what really makes the job of it, being a teacher a hard one too, is. All right, the next question is, is related. What is your approach for students in your class who are clearly there to be disruptive when it comes to DEI anti-racism and who are seeking to cause trouble beyond the classroom? This becomes an issue for the instructor who may be vulnerable, as well as for students who may be traumatized by the behavior. Um, sorry, I'm happy to go, or you can go, it's up to you. Um, so I've never had that issue in the past 15 years that I've been teaching. I, I wanna be very clear about that. But, I, but I'm not saying that it doesn't present itself as an issue. Uh, for me, my approach to class, I think we, you know, the most important thing is we need to emphasize building a good relationship with our students, where it, you form a community with your students. And I think the exercise that I have described, asking people to share their items and talk about, is not just the first day class, it's, it's an ongoing. And I think by, I think if you're starting to having those things, that means your teaching needs some help in a certain way, because I agree, I think there will be students, well, but I think we have to create, I think it came up also in one of the survey that I did, a pre-course survey, one of the students, we expect we're gonna be discussing sensitive topics and we will. We want to see some guidelines in the syllabus, right? Anyway, I have those guidelines about scholarly discourse and about 
being respectful and how do you conduct and how do you, you know not to instruct us and so on and so forth. But also the idea is to build a good relationship amongst your uh, have create a participation framework that is a climate that is inclusive and respectful. So when you start to having those things, that means your class is not inclusive. Having those issues, that means you need to work. Uh, but personally speaking, I've never had, um, I cannot speak from experience because I've never encountered an issue like that in my, uh, in my teaching practice. Um, I, I unfortunately have. Um, and I guess I'd start by saying um, that it's important for instructors to know their rights. Um, this is true of any instructor, but especially for people who are in, in oppressed, vulnerable, marginalized groups, they will be targets for some students. We know this, there's plenty of research on it. And so it's really important that you know before you step foot in the classroom, virtually or otherwise, what you can and can't count on from the institution in terms of protection of your rights. Um, there, we do have a certain amount of freedom um, to ensure that our classroom is not disrupted. I know at my own institution, I can ask students to leave, and if I have to, I have, in the classroom, there's an emergency phone. I can call a, a number if it becomes that extreme. It has never become that extreme. Um, but I think there's, first you want to know what your options are. Um, then you want to know um, what, you know, will the institution back you up? If they won't, then you're going to have to make some compromises for your own safety and the safety of other students um, and their basic ability to learn. Um, if you've got somebody who's so disruptive that you cannot teach, this cannot be your problem. This is the institution's problem. Um, and it's not your job to make the material palatable for students who are in there for the purpose of disruption. Uh, that said, you can turn the tables. I have had uh, students in one class where I was allowing social media as a form of communication in the classroom. This is a class of 350 students or so. Um, I had a student use a white supremacist symbol um, in the class uh, using a, a, something that um, was not caught at the time by most of the students, but was caught by one of the TAs. I talked to that student who denied all knowledge of this. Um, and didn't realize that's what it was. And so I turned it into a lecture. Um, so I did not name the student, but I let the students know that this incident had happened, what the impact was on those who recognized the symbol, what the history of the symbol was, why it was so complex, how it fit into politics in the current moment. Uh, that student never piped up again. Um, I don't know if it subdued him or what, um, or if it really was unintentional in the first place. Um, but it was a moment where I tried to confront it publicly rather than hide it. And I was able to do that as a senior scholar who was not personally being targeted by that symbol. Um, if I had been a different person, I would have certainly had to handle that differently. Um, and so you really need to think about your own subject position, what the institution is going to allow you to do, and what feels right to you. Never put yourself in jeopardy. You're on mute, I think, I, I can't. Yeah, Lynn, we can't hear you. Yeah. There we go. Now you can hear me. I had muted myself. Um, this is a big picture question. What would an institutional protocol and accountability look like for being a space for DEI, anti-racism and decolonization? I know you've said don't depend on the institution. I agree that we need to interrogate ideologies, interrogate ourselves, and interrogate institutions. And there is a connection across all three. Uh, where one starts seemed to be an issue. But at the institutional level, what would that look like? I'm looking at Sudi because I think your institution is doing a better job than mine is on this. We are doing an amazing job. So um, I'm, I'm not I'm in terms of um, um, I'm trying to understand. I would like to answer the question, but uh, what is the? I, I mean, I, I I'm I'm trying to get to the gist of the question here. What is the? Uh, are we? Uh, is it? Uh, is the is the person asking the question um, seeking advice on what to? Sorry, if you don't mind. Um, I believe so. Um, so, 
I think that the question is, how do you get institutional commitment um, and buy-in and accountability well, from we have the institution? We have that at the University of Pittsburgh. We 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 have in, I think the University of Pittsburgh we are doing an amazing job with uh, on these topics. And, and I, I so I I don't need to convince I I don't need to convince them as far as I'm concerned. So uh, I think how did a, that develop? Where where did that come from? Uh, we uh, well I mean um, so we we have um, a strategic plan at the University of Pittsburgh and uh, topics like diversity and inclusion really are recognized officially uh, important. So it it came from having the university having uh, liberals, leaders, and, and and people who want to make things better for everyone is where it comes from. Leaders, good leadership is where it comes from. Having a good leadership is 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 where it comes from. Uh, yeah. We didn't. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, go I ahead. didn't mean to step on your your turn there, so to go ahead. No, it's it, it's uh, it, it really comes from good leadership. I mean, it's I think it it applies across the board. If you have a good leader, you have a good leader. If you don't have a good leader, then you don't have a good leader. And so, uh, and and if you don't have a good leader, then the place to start would be change of leadership. As uh, otherwise, what are you going to spend all your energy fighting with the leadership every day? I mean the. A good start, like I said, would be either change of leadership, but if you are lucky to have a good leadership, I, I personally, we have an amazing leadership um, uh, that are, they are very uh, sensitive and um, care a lot about uh, yeah, creating inclusive environments and safe environments for, for everyone. So, but go ahead, Mary, sorry. Oh, no, thanks. Yeah, and I think um, speaking from my perspective, it may be um, also um, that I am talking more to students who are feeling the sense of urgency. My sense is that there are people who see my institution as doing a pretty good job. Um, but I talk a lot to both undergraduates and graduates who sort of feel like, you know, the world is on fire and what are we doing here? And so um, there's energy for change that is not being met with the same energy at the level of administrators and faculty. Some faculty definitely are and some administrators. Um, but we also, as the UC system is a weak administration system, um, everything is done through faculty governance and not administrative mandates. And so trying to get people to buy in because we can't have these kind of top down requirements does um, cause some challenges for things where the institution representatives might want to make change but don't really have a mechanism for doing so that um, is mandated as opposed to recommended. Um, that said, Again, I'm going to push with push on the idea of grassroots change. Um, so at UCSB, some of the biggest changes we've had um, in recent years have been entirely because of student activism. Um, so the Black Student Union uh, several years ago uh, shut down the administrative, uh, you know, sat in, did, did a protest, kind of let people know they were not happy with what was going on, and rightly so. Um, those students um, had, were poorly supported by the institution. Um, despite uh, kind of official efforts, uh, no, no changes were actually being made as a result. And that the students' activism uh, led to the creation of the North Hall chairs in Black Studies, which are um, four endowed chairs across the, uh, the institution. Uh, so one is in linguistics and they're in other uh, departments as well. This is not a perfect mechanism because um, although the linguistics department very fortunately got one of these um, and hired Professor Ann Charity Hudley, who is a transformational change agent, if any of you know her, uh, she is remarkable and has changed the institution in many ways just by the work of one person. Um, the other positions um, are, have been more difficult to fill and keep filled. Um, so this is why, I, although I can see the changes that an individual can make if the institution gives them the latitude to do so and the resources, I don't see the institution as the solution. Um, so if you don't feel like you have a lot of institutional power, please work with others to enhance and amplify the power you do have. Um, if you do have institutional power, please use it. And I, I don't want to mislead, I not rely on completing leadership. Having good leadership is good, but also having a leadership that will allow you to pursue those bottom up approaches, grassroots initiatives. Because, of course, you know, it can't, it has to work both ways, is, is what I want to say. You know. Great, thank you. 
um, the next question is from a scholar in Papua New Guinea. Craig Volker said, I have enjoyed the ideas of sharing, shared about making classrooms and hopefully the discipline more inclusive. Thank you. As a person living and working in Papua New Guinea, I'd be interested in suggestions from colleagues at institutions in the first world about how to deal with a situation in many third world societies where the opportunities to become a professional linguist are poor or non-existent and where research is dominated by researchers from the global north. On a global scale, how can the discipline become more inclusive by creating opportunities for young linguists from countries such as Papua New Guinea Papua New Guinea to develop? I feel like I am by no means an expert on this topic. Um, I, I think the expertise really about what needs to happen probably needs to be led by uh, scholars and activists in the global south to educate those of us in the global north for whom this is a huge problem of lack of awareness, lack of resources, lack of understanding of what we need to be doing. Um, I can imagine things, um, partnerships, collaborations, um, opportunities to redistribute resources between institutions. Um, and I know some of those things are already in place, uh, but I feel like probably we need to be learning from you uh, far more than uh, you can learn, at least from me on this topic. Sudi, do you? I mean, it is an excellent question. I can yeah. relate to that. I can understand to some degree where the person, I'm also a linguist who started um, a linguistics career in, in, in Morocco, and I was limited in terms of opportunities and things that I could do. So I guess there should, there should be a lot of things to connect with other linguists in other places. Um, and I think we need to um, do a better job in that creating opportunities uh, uh, I'm happy if the person wants to be in touch directly uh, via email. I'm happy to uh, to discuss and, and explore uh, ideas and how we can how we can help each other. Uh, I was a linguist in in Morocco, and I, like I said, I was very limited in terms of what I, I was um, in terms of what I could access. Um, so if there are any things that I can um, uh, help with, I would be very happy to. But I really like to get in touch with the person who asked the question to uh, to learn more and, and exchange ideas. So my email is available if, uh, on there, sudia, S-O-U-D-I-A, at P-I-T-T dot E-G-U. I'm, I'm very happy to chat. All right, we're, we're coming up on the end here. Um, there, one quick question, uh, Sudi, and then maybe we can, um, what does the H2P in the mask in your background mean? In uh, Hail to Pit. <laughs> ah, all right. There we go. I knew that was easy. Um, and, and for your pre-course survey, can you share some of the answers with the group of the kinds of information you get from your students? Um, it is, an, for, you know, I don't say who said what, obviously, in terms of the context with my students, right? So I did the pre-course and a meeting with my first, with students. The idea for those questions are, is I, I take those response, I share them in the syllabus, so I put them in the syllabus. You know, I've, I've, by getting those answers, I redesign my syllabus and build those expectations into, uh, into the syllabus. In my lecture one, I do talk about my approach to teaching and, and, and building an inclusive environment. This morning, for example, as Mary highlighted earlier, I talked about flexibility. I mean, during COVID-19, flexibility is the best approach. And I told my students that I know, I recognize, so I'm not saying that was came from the survey, but I recognize that I have three kinds of participants in this class. There will be students who are coming in person, there will be students who are remote, and there will be students who are going to be asynchronous. I also understand that people are coming to the class from diverse backgrounds and, you know, so I'm giving them ideas, getting their questions, their answers, but building them into my approach so they can feel at home and welcome and included in, in, in the class. I, I, I hope that answers the, 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 the question, but I don't take the answers all and put them together and here, are, here is the results of the, of the survey. I build them into my conversations with the class, into my approaches ongoingly, 
and they got them as well into the syllabus itself. So doing a pre-course survey, don't wait until the day before, I would say, send it a little bit earlier <laughs> so you're able to, uh, to, build, to, to, to build that information into your, uh, into your pass. Well, thank you everybody for joining right, us. Thank uh, you both. Sorry, go ahead, Lynn. Go ahead. That was all I was going to say was thank you. <laughs> I'll echo Lynn's uh, thanks to our panelists uh, for sharing your time and your your expertise in this area with us. Thank you to our interpreters and thank you to all of you for taking the time out of your afternoons to be with us. Um, we will have a recording of the webinar available, um, possibly. I th actually, I think not this afternoon, but uh, no later than tomorrow. And we'll have uh, copies of the handouts and some additional information uh, along uh, available along with the recording. So again, uh, thanks everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye now. Thank you.